beyond Fahrenheit. That part. Well, <clears throat> welcome to another episode of Federo Speaks. This is a very, very, very special episode where I have some very special guest panelists that will be introducing themselves in a moment. The topic of this week is a continuation of the topic uh, that we had last month on the topic of suicide. This particular week, we're going to be digging deeper into the mental health aspect of suicide and the causes as well as analyzing some of the statistics around mental health as it relates to men in america um as i stated before and on all of the other uh, discussions that we had i really feel like this is a very important topic for our culture for our society for um our our country as well as for the world there's definitely some mental issues as well as some suicidal rates that are quite alarming when you think of, of women as a uh, as a gender and and begin to really dissect uh suicide globally when you begin to dissect um suicide amongst men and their success rates versus that of women is quite alarming and then when we begin to discuss it as it relates to the youth there's definitely some alarming statistics um that are coming out um in relation to the pandemic um and all of the anxiety and what i believe the ptsd that we're going to experience from that and that we are experiencing just from that particular experience so this particular conversation i believe is crucial and critical to um to our society to our culture to our communities, to our household, and to each one of us individually, be it that we all have to deal with this world. We all um, typically go through some type of mental stress, have mental stressors placed upon us as men, as black men, um, as providers and so forth. So we're gonna really dig deeper into the discussion of mental health and really um, begin to discuss just some of the more personal aspects of it as well as the more far-reaching um effects of, of of suicide and mental health issues amongst men so with that said i want to take this opportunity and introduce our very special guest first up we have Maurice Gu. Maurice, would you properly introduce yourself matter of fact let me just say Maurice is my big bro Love Maurice. He is my mentor. Um, there's very few people that I allow to to really pour into me. He's one of those uh the few people in the world that I, I really look up to um and allow to really feed me as a mentor. So just had to give him that big shout out. Go ahead, Maurice. Well, thank you for the for Daryl for those kind words. Hey everyone, I'm Maurice Gu. Uh I'm a father of two uh twins. Uh, here in Chicago, uh, I am also an attorney, uh, practice in the areas of business law, uh, business litigation. Um, I am a mentor to other, and besides for Daryl, but teenagers as well, uh, men and as well as uh, young ladies. Uh, and it's uh, such a pleasure to be on a panel with you, uh, these such distinguished other guests on here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for that, Maurice. And welcome. And we're, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Next up, we have none other than Michael Baller, who is a returning guest panelist, um, who is definitely a dear friend of mine, go way, way, way back, maybe like pacifier, um, super talented. Yeah, and I'm gonna allow him to tell you more about himself before I, before I blow him up. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Mike. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being, uh, being uh, honored, it's an honor to come back. Uh, I am a uh, pastor. I'm also a writer and producer, work in entertainment industry. Uh, and currently we uh, moved to Chicago in December. We're here in Miami Beach, me and my beautiful wife, uh, Siobhan, and our newborn, Cameron, who just turned nine months. Uh, and we have a private practice uh, certified relationship coaching where we are uh, building up Christian families. Um, me and Federico, yeah, go back. Woo. Yeah, before I had 
for my my, my other two children, uh, Michael and Michaela, back in Chicago. I got a 25 year old, a 20 year old, and I am now officially a grandpa. My daughter is pregnant, uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and PWP, uh, this beautiful organization. I think I'm a grand uncle. I was around when this was a concept that just came out of Federico's mouth uh, years ago when we actually had another company back in the day. So it's amazing to see this um, this company growing, and I'm looking forward to being on with these dope gentlemen. So thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, Mike. I appreciate you, man. I'm trying to send out our brother another email. Somebody trying to get on, so I may seem a little distracted. But next up, we have none other than the amazing, just phenomenal person of Darren Calhoun. I don't even know what to say all about this brother, except for he is probably one of my dearest, dearest friends. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of just people who have impacted my life, can't really, really mark many others, and that may be for good or for bad. We still <laughs> try to return it, uh, but there's definitely been an impact nonetheless. So, with that said, I um, really give some mic over to uh, Darren. Hey, everybody, good to get to be here again. Um, Darren Calhoun, pronouns he him, joining from Chicago where um, I do several things. I'm an artist, a worship leader. Um, I sing in a band called The Many, and I do advocacy um, around racial justice and LGBTQ inclusion, especially in churches, um, and where I just bring my story and the ways that our stories uh, really do impact lives and change entire like scenarios. So glad to be here again. Good to see you, Fidel. Hey, Dad. All right. Thank you, Darren. Next up, we have the incomparable, the super smooth, always a gentleman, Antoine Johnson. Antoine is my homie, 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 way back from college now. Woo! Like, yo, that's way, way back. Um, I ain't that old, Lord Jesus. I guess we are. Antoine, we that old, bro. Hey, hey talk for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we that old. But uh, with that said, I want to introduce you guys to Antoine Johnson. Hello, everybody. As Fidero said, my name is Antoine Johnson. We met back in St. Xavier and back in mm, 2000 and, no, yeah, 2000 and <clears throat> that, 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 <laughs> little, <laughs> that, little. yeah, but, uh, even ever since then, Federa always inspired me as an artist, even though I did not want to go into formal arts or artistry, but wound up taking that field, starting a nonprofit back here in 2010, became a film production and stage production back in 2019, Inspiring Minds LLC. And I'm an active member of my church. And Pretty much work well. The Lord see fit for me to put my hands in. Dope, dope. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Antoine. Thank you for not saying the year. <laughs> Hello. Hey, you there. <laughs> He'll put all our business out there. But again, I want to welcome all of these distinguished panelists to this conversation. Before we begin, I want to state that the information presented in this discussion may be triggering to some people. If you are having suicidal thoughts, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273. 8255 for support and assistance from a trained counselor. If you or a loved one is in immediate danger, please call 911. All right. So with that said, I'm going to ask you guys to mute yourselves. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I, I got a series of things I want to talk about. So I know, like I said, this particular topic is heavy. So I'm, what I'm going to do is just toss out some questions randomly to you guys. Um, I, I encourage you to answer them as openly as possible. Um, and if you anyone else want to 
jump in on someone else's question and have anything to add before we move on, feel free to do so. Like I said, this is an open platform, a safe space for you to share your thoughts, share your feelings, share your concerns. So um, I definitely want to open the door and open the window for all of that to take place. So with that said, the goal of this discussion is to discuss how mental health issues are common um, our common occurrence amongst men in America. It's also to discuss the causes of higher rates of suicide and mental health issues amongst the LGBTQ community. It's also to discuss how male masculinity and emotional illiteracy re results in men being less likely than women to have a positive view of, of therapy. Another goal is to discuss the social and economic factors that affect men's mental health and suicide rates in America. And lastly, our goal is to understand the, that mental health, mental illnesses can be treated and we all have a role to play in both the education and the prevention of suicide as well as suicides related to uh, mental health disorders. All right, so before we begin, are there any questions? Cool, well, let's dig right in, cool. All right, so an estimated 26% of Americans ages 18 and older, um, which is about one in four adults, suffer from a, a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. I think that's important to understand because Usually we, we talk about mental disorders as if they are long-term, usually these long-term events, but they, a mental disorder can usually, you know, sometimes be a very short-term, but very impactful event, event that can happen within a person's life within a short of, amount of time. And that event alone can be triggering and powerful enough to cause suicide, especially if we if we don't, if these particular events aren't managed well, if they if the people do not receive support um, that they need when when encountering a particular episode. So we know over the past year we just went through the pandemic. I talk a lot about how this particular pandemic was did a doozy for me in my mental um, in regards to just challenging, you know, my own strength and fortitude to, to stand against a variety of different uh, challenges that the pandemic brought about it, brought about as it relates to me personally. I wanted to ask um, Maurice specifically for you how did you um how are you aff affected mentally by the pandemic over the past past year well i think over the past year um uh, the stress of um i'm a social person and you know part of my business or a business component of my business is to be out and market talking to clients that's how you get clients when you're on your own uh, shop your own firm you know, a lot of the things you have to do is it's you uh, supporting yourself uh, or others. And uh, it, it ends, it begins and ends with you. So not being able to go out, you know, you have those different stressors of the, the fact that it's already difficult uh, when you're a uh, sole, uh, uh, and a solo practitioner, uh, or even if you were with another firm, it's difficult to go out and get other clients and things like that. And so you know, it's just extra stress that's added. Um, and then you, you know, the social aspect of not being able to, you know, interact with family members uh, for that, that period of time. Um, it just really, I think it weighed on me. And I think it still is to some degree. Uh, I can't say that I'm out of that funk right now. Um, you know, I've been pushing myself to go out socially, you know, um, even though it's, but it's, I guess it's because of the you know, you still have this, I guess, variant D that's supposed to be out there. So you're kind of like mask, no mask, you know, uh, do I jump in a, in a, um, uh, a full kind of like arena where there are a lot of people and things like that. So you still have those, they're like hues 
and whether or not you, you know, you admit them or not, I mean, for me, they're still there. And so I struggled with that a little bit, uh, just getting out and about and those kind of things. How are you, um, if you don't mind me asking, how are you managing uh, your mental health, be it that you admit that you struggle with that? How are you managing that struggle? Well, managing, I'm doing it by, again, uh, trying to force myself to get out and, and actually be around family members, uh, friends and those kind of things. Uh, because I think that kind of, you know, uh, eases that, that tension or that pressure or whatever you might be feeling, at least for me, it does. Uh, and being able to interact with those people, uh, laughing, I think laughter uh, releases endorphins that make you feel better. And, you know, uh, that, and, and maybe I, I might even go and get what they, I call a, uh, like a tune up with my counselor. I had counseling before. And so one of the things I might do is, is go back and I did reach out to my counselor and said, Hey, look, um, are you seeing people in person at the time? She was like, no, we can do something. If you need to talk over the phone, we can do that. But I, I find that that helps as well. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to shoot this question over to Darren. Darren, over the past year, how has the pandemic affected you mentally? Um, it has been uh, the deepest time for me to to uh, to self-reflect and to face a whole bunch of things that were just kind of quietly sitting in the background that were obscured by the ways that we stay busy and on the go and the ways that we just fall into a routine that just feels like normal. Um, and that can cover up all the ways that we are, are not dealing with our stuff. Um, and so I'd already, um, I'd already restarted therapy um, a few months before the pandemic kind of got into full, full gear. Um, but I remember pretty specifically, um, yeah, uh, shortly after the lockdown began, um, I, started, uh, I started using or started taking a, an antidepressant. And that was huge in that for the first time, I was like, oh, wait, this is what it's like to get up in the morning and not like struggle. Oh, hold on. This has been around since high school or college at least. But again, having such this routine that, oh, I'm struggling because I'm tired. Oh, I'm struggling because I got a lot to do on my plate. Oh, I'm struggling because this, that, that, that. And all of a sudden everything changed. It was just like, oh, I can actually figure out what's going on because now nothing is normal, but I still feel the same. I still feel exhausted. I feel, still feel like I can't do the bare minimum. Um, and so it was, a, it was a deep dive into that, like starting medication um, and antidepressants, starting uh, or continuing in therapy with my, with my therapist online um, and having, having this extended space to just rest right? Like how much have we attached our, our self-worth and ego to always being on the go, to always being busy, to always doing something. And then when the most effective thing you can do is nothing and the way you kind of like, if you've attached your worth to what you do and now you have to do nothing, the way you spiral and the way you're like, oh, I got to do something. I got to find something like those kind of things really come up. Um, and so it's just been a time for me to reassess my relationships, for me to reassess the ways that I work, for me to, uh, to kind of change the way I, I experience my own life. Um, and there have been every high and low in that from like, oh, I don't want to see none of this to, wow, this is great. I don't want to ever go back to, to the way we were before to, oh, I'm tired of this. Uh, <laughs> I want to go and do something someplace. Also, I don't like people. No, um, you know, it's just <laughs> all of these tensions existing at once. Um, and again, having this space to be present with all of it. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it has been a journey and it's a continuing journey. But I think my biggest takeaway is um, I've learned too much to go back to whatever life was before the pandemic. That's a very powerful takeaway, Darren. I'm going to even ask you to expound on that. what have you learned specifically um, 
number one, you know, about yourself, but what have you also learned in regards to coping with the various stressors that other than, I know you said like taking an antidepressant, but what have you learned um, from, from, from those experiences in regards to how you can better manage like your mental, your mental health now? Mm -hmm. Yep. One of the, one of the biggest things uh, has been uh, growing in the capacity to ask for help. Um, We just, we just teach this grind culture. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to just sweat it out. I'm going to white knuckle through it. And it's just like, no, that, that, that ain't it because we're in a society that, that, and this is my anti-capitalist rant. So plug your ears if that's upsetting, but we're in this capitalistic society that has taught us that the only way we have worth is to constantly be producing. And we have to always be producing more than we did in the past. Otherwise there's something wrong. The reality is that um, I can't always produce the same thing, the same amount forever. I am a human being. I'm an organic being. I change. I grow. I'm I'm different from day to day. And for me to disconnect from this demand of always being on and always producing and instead be like, oh, no, I need help with this. Or I don't know what I'm doing, but I can figure it out. And just being transparent about that. those are the kind of things that we were, I think we were like taught not to do by our society, by our family, by some of our loved ones. Some, you know, maybe we had a spouse who we always had to be strong for. And then you realize that's toxic. We, we can't be strong all the time. We can fake it. We can front. But um, realizing, again, realizing the, the necessity, the essentialness of asking for help. Um, and then um, giving permission to myself to rest, permission to, for myself to not have it together, permission for myself to cry, permission for myself to, um, to, to feel bad feelings. Like we have, we've been socialized again, we've been taught by our families and friends and, and what we see on, in media, we've been taught not to feel bad feelings, avoid the bad feelings, you're gonna get stuck. No. You're going to feel the bad feelings and work through them. <laughs> You're going to feel the bad feelings and maybe discover that some things need to change and some relationships aren't working the way that you hope they would. But if we don't work with the fat bad feelings, then we just find ourselves, everything's stupid. Everything's just, just bad. You know, we just have this very generalized frustration and we don't know what to do with it. It's just like, no, that's, that's your stuff that you haven't dealt with. <laughs> so um, learning to, to sit with those emotions, see what they are, ask them questions, uh, listen to the feedback and go, you know what, it might, my job maybe isn't horrible. Maybe I just don't want to do this job anymore. Maybe I need to change. So sitting with uncomfortable questions and, and feelings. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was very, very powerful, um, especially I think the part about just being able to go internally and ask yourself some of those key and important questions that are sometimes so easy to avoid, um, especially when there's no one there challenging you to answer them. Um, I think as men, it's important that we provide that challenge for ourselves. We shouldn't um, always expect someone to hold us our feet to the fire, you know, and when it comes to taking accountability, accountability for self and taking responsibility for our mental health and our well-being and so forth, um, I think that really begins, like you said, with realizing that this is my responsibility, my help equals my responsibility. And so therefore, um, it's important that I ask myself the important questions that I need to get the help that I need. Um, so I think that was very, very important. I said we have another very distinguished gentleman joining us this evening in the person of Aubrey Smith. I'm going to allow Aubrey to introduce himself really quickly. Oh, we got uh, my brother James. All right, right in the nick of time. We got my brother James um, who's joining the, the conversation as well. So really quickly, I'm going to have Aubrey introduce himself and then James, and then I'm going to toss the question back over to Michael, um, who I know has 
also going through a huge transition as it relates to uh, the pandemic and so forth. Um, and so the question, again, Mike, just to pre-prep you, um, the question is, how has your mental health um, as a man been affected over the past year due to the pandemic? So I'm going to sit there with you, toss the mic over to Aubrey. Hey, Aubrey, what's going on, bro? So I'm not really sure if you're saying Aubrey because you know that annoys me because you know my name is Aubrey. Oh, oh Lord. I, I don't know if you're doing that oh, on purpose. Lord. I see Maurice oh, laughing. Lord. Because Lord. I, because, Lord. You know, I, I know. The pronunciation know. of my name. And because Aubrey. it is my, Yes, Aubrey. it is how I am identified. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I have to correct you. But at this point in our relationship, you it. should know that. Go for it, Aubrey. Uh, okay. So, welcome, let's to take Aubrey. two. I keep um, seeing my cousin's name is and which is Audrey. And yeah, go ahead. What up, Aubrey? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I don't know what you want me to say besides that my name is Aubrey Smith. Um what else did you want to know? The the the, the introduction was simply to introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, what you do. Oh, okay. You can also even add how you know me. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so I am from Chicago. Currently, I am the head of the English department at Horizon Science Academy. Um, it's a high school here. Uh, I met you through uh, New Life, the uh, identity ministry where we served our, our young people. Um, and I think we connected because of the passion that you have for our young people, specifically changing the narrative for our, our young men. So. Um, that's actually how you, you and Maurice and myself know each other. So, um, and we asked me to be a part of it. I said, absolutely. Although I didn't, I didn't get the link, but we can talk about that later. I bet you're not going to come on here and bust me out. I'm going to chop and screw all of this whole part out. This is going to be edited. Chop, chop, chop. Oh, no, but thank you for uh, sure. that introduction. Next, we have James. What up, James? What's up, bro? How's it going? I didn't hear no sound all the way up until my name. I just got it right to say my name. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'm just giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself. I know you're a returning panelist, but just to introduce yourself to the fellows that do not know you, um, just want to uh, where you're from, what's your name, what do you do? You know, uh, well, my name is James James Bentley. Uh, I'm known as KJ in the music and entertainment world. Currently running a publishing company, as well as producing uh, independent films. Uh, I met Fidel on Reverb Nation years back when he was number one and I was number one for the rap. And we was collabing on those type of things. And over years, just kept in touch. And now we finally had time to mesh with each other. And hopefully we're going to bring about some, some good works on this planet, man. And that's crazy. Awesome, awesome. I appreciate you, Abre, and I appreciate you, James, for uh, participating with this discussion, man. Um, so I'm going to toss it back over to that of uh, Michael Ballard. Michael, tell us how has the pandemic affected you mentally um, over the past year? You know, uh, when it first started, it was excruciating. I felt like it was, I was felt like it was being suffocated. You know, I, I, first time I felt what going stir crazy felt like. Uh, when I first started, I was back in Westmont, Illinois. It was very gray uh, town. It was, it was not as vibrant as Miami Beach, uh, I can tell you. And, you know, I walked around my backyard so many times, I started naming leaves and plants and grass, man. I'm talking, it was, it was brutal. Uh, and at that time, too, uh, I was just going through a downturn in my marriage at that time. And, and I think everything that I held high, everything that I built the foundation on just came tumbling down. Uh, lost my identity, who I was, because um, I think this pandemic was a really a way of God to shake 
everything that you thought you knew about yourself and about the world and about your job and about everything. It was um, definitely a, a, a earth shattering moment uh, mentally. Um, but coming out of it, you know, I realized that it was the best thing that happened to me um, because it was a rebirth, rebirth for my marriage, a rebirth for me as a man, a rebirth of my understanding about economics, uh, about employment. It was it was like a shaking uh, to really find out, man, that what I thought was true wasn't. Um, but the only thing that was true is that you can't put God in a box. And it was definitely, uh, you know, when we read the Bible, we, we, you know, we always read the story because we know how it ends. But when people in the Bible are going through, they never know how it's ends. So, you know, that's what it felt like, you know, for me, like, you know, now I know how it ends because it's ended. And now I'm like, oh, my God, this, this was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I remember. Uh, when I was going through with my marriage and everything, a friend of mine said, you know, sometimes we look at things and we think that it's a bad thing. But, you know, the scripture that came that says all things work together for the good. God once told me, yeah, that's true, but I never said it's going to feel good. And I think sometimes we think that those two are the same, but sometimes the things that work out for our good don't necessarily feel good. And so it was a shaking for me um, to really refocus me because I was, I was on a slippery slope with issues within myself that I didn't know were there. So this pandemic forced the poison to come out of me. And that didn't feel good at all. You know, I was, um, but I'm so grateful for it now, looking back that I'm a better man today because of that pandemic. So I'm thankful for it uh, on today. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. Um, next up. So here's the next question. Well, I want to read this particular st statistic and then toss this question over to Antoine and then over to Abre. So the, the statistics state that 28%, approximately 30% of men um, who were diagnosed with uh, mental health disorder have not sought help, have not sought help compared to 20% of the women who also have a mental health disorder. What do you think is happening with men where we are less likely, even though we are experiencing obvious signs of mental distress, mental uh, illness and disorders? What do you think prevents men from actually seeking help, especially in relation and in comparison to women? With me first, right? Yes, sir. The issue with a lot of men, and I was one of the ones in that box that we have the, the thought that we'll get over it. We don't want to see no professionals to get in our business. We don't want to seem like we crazy, and especially the men that's in church, just gonna pray it out, to pray the issues out. And unfortunately, the church, not the fact that they wrong, the fact that they a lot of people that run church don't know no better. And because that that is a, a domino effect that, oh, I'll be okay, especially if you um, raised in the hood. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't need nobody in my business. I don't need no professional help. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I just talked to granny. I just talked to grandma. I just talked to so, 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 so they got wisdom. They got, I don't need this. But guess what? That wind up back backfiring on people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You said, you made the statement that you're one of those people. Um, can I ask you what have you done, if anything, when you when you find yourself struggling mentally? What are some of the things that you've done um, to kind of help bring yourself out of that space? Well, me, fortunately, a few months before the pandemic hit, when my granddad's last bishop passed away, 
I got professional help because I need to see a professional since my daddy died in 1985, but I never did. Then right before I went back to St. Xavier, my mom had died and I still didn't get professional help. So all the years 2000, from 2005 to 2019, there was a lot in fight with my last grandparent, my grandfather, and my spiritual father passed away. All the issues from 1995 up to 2019 hit me. Unfortunately, my god brother, when I was talking to him, said, Antoine, you could talk to me, but I'm going to give you this number to talk to a professional. I'm like, no arguments here. I will do that immediately. And that's the best decision I ever made. And I still contact my so when the pandemic hit and I, and I was having issues with my mastery program, I'm like, okay, hold on. Help. There's so many words. Because if you have mental issues going on like that, you can't pray. <laughs> I'm talking for real, for real. Um, I, I, I listen, I know personally, um, as I mentioned before, when I was going through my my dark period over the pandemic prayer was, and I think I'm a pretty powerful prayer, but prayer was very difficult. Um, I found myself just allowing, just sitting under different ministers as they prayed because I couldn't find the words to say them myself. Um, and while that was effective, it was astounding to me that someone who's used to being articulate, um, articulative in, in, relation, in relation to how I communicate with the guy, all of a sudden it was, I, I had no words. Um, the, the cloud, the tunnel was so dark that it muted my, my words, what seemed like my communication with the father. So I definitely know firsthand um, what you're what you're uh, stating Antoine um, so I'm going to toss this question back over to Abre. Abre, why do you feel like um, so many men are less likely to seek mental health um, especially in comparison I think this is a unique comparison um, especially for any women that are watching in comparison to women, what is the difference between why men are less likely to seek help as it relates to mental disorders at, um, compared to women? Um, so obviously, I'm not professional in this, but I, I think it. I think it's culturally. Like, I can only think. I, I think in our community, especially, um, sort of what Antoine is saying. Like, we we don't speak of it. We 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 raised. We've raised our children and we've been raised to say, don't discuss anything that's gone on in my house. And so we have this way of thinking, this way of living um, and just culturally to back, to piggyback what Antoine is saying, like it, the answer has always been to pray. Um, but realistically speaking, that has its place. So I just think that while I think if we're talking about men in general, there's this ego that we all have where, you know, that I'll, I'll get it done because that's the way society has, has had us build ourselves up where we, we know it all, we, we, we'll, we'll see it all. And so therefore, when a problem come, we, we, we no longer Clark Kent, but we are Superman. And that's a false interpretation of how to live. But then when we talk about specifically in our community, we don't speak of that. Um, for, so that I don't sound disrespectful. It's trendy now, but it's also necessary. So it's the thing that people are doing because we've lost so many. And if we don't give the space for our boys, I'm not discounting our girls, but if we don't give the space, then we're actually perpetuating the narrative. And, and, and that's how they become the thing that we're all trying to fight against. At least I try to fight against is that we're, we're, we're always told that we're the angry black men, but the truth of the matter is some of us really are, but it's not to our fault. It's a detriment because we haven't been given the space to say, I hurt, this hurts, I don't understand. And, and we don't give that space to say, hey, for there, it's okay if the way you're expressing this right now is through your tears. But the, the community that I came from you almost wanted to withhold those because you didn't want to be seen as soft. 
You didn't want to be seen as weak. And so therefore we suppress it. We deposit it back here. But the problem is we never go back to revisit until we become traumatized somewhere. And then all of a sudden, you know, but it's been there all along. So I'm, I'm grateful that we're finally at a space where we can, and I hate that it's trending. So I don't want to sound disrespectful by saying that, but it's the thing that everybody's talking about right now. You know, let's go seek help. And, and, and so we have to change that. And I think that's part of it. Um, it's no fault of our, uh, of our, you know, our parents and our grandparents, um, but we have the ability. Those of us who are fathers, we have the ability to change it so that it is a, a norm. I, I think I'm a great father, but I don't know all the answer. And sometimes as close as my son and I, as close as we are, there are some things I just don't know. And we have to be able to encourage, this, this is our future. This is our future. This is, this is our legacy. And so if we have to talk about preserving our legacy, then we have to start with their mental man as well. I don't care how physically strong they are. I don't even care how spiritually strong they are. You know, I know some people who can quote from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between, but something's not connecting here. And that's, so we have to find a way to give that space. And so I think that's what it is. I think some of it culturally, we just have always been this, and, and it's admirable at times where we can fight through, but if by chance we're, we're not able to, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, James, I have a question for you, and I think I'm gonna perhaps pose this question to all of the fellas. Um, because I know we all grew up in different backgrounds, uh, different households, um, but I'll pose it to you first, James. So thinking back on your childhood, how much of your mental health do you believe has been affected by your childhood history um, and other generational causes? I know Aubrey uh, spoke about legacy and so forth. Um, how much, especially as a father, as a son, has your your mental health been affected by your your childhood? Oh, <clears throat> uh, my, my life has been totally affected by my entire childhood. I can't go into it all right now, but it was very complicated. Being raised by a man that wasn't your father, you find out at 13 he, he wasn't your father. You thought all these years he was. And then for the for the uh, the uh, treatment that I was subjected to all that time to start realizing that it was because I had my father's face that those looks were coming the way they were coming and things like that. Um, then coupled with the fact that I still love her, my father, you know, the man that raised me, you know, because there was a deep down thing for me to want to impress him and change that. You know, I just think it was my fault that he didn't love me. Um, mentally, it made me strong on one end, but then on the other end, it made me kind of weak because with my own kids, I tried so hard to be opposite that when when opportunities wasn't there for me to be there because baby mama on her stuff or blah, 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 and then they're reaching out to me now, I'm in a bad situation because I've allowed what I went through to put me in a life of drugs and stuff, you know, so... You know, it was like disappointment after disappointment, compound, compound, kept, you know, this thing caused me to do this. So now I definitely go getting farther away from my children and this and that. And then um, it affected me all the way up until now. <clears throat> I got professional help for the first time probably four years ago, maybe five. And it was odd because it death of a coworker. You know, the job suggested, hey, you know, you were right there, you know, and da da da. You know, you watch take a last breath, uh, get some help. And then things came out of me that I was like, wow, I'm in a hole. Really? I've been doing it so long that it became normal. I didn't know I was, <laughs> you know, post traumatically stressed. I didn't know that. I didn't know these, I'm not, I didn't even know the definition of those things. But when I started seeing them, and it just made me adjust and, you know, get stronger. And the brothers say that, you know, prayer is what we all should, you know, ascribe to. But after your prayer, 
we have to remember to quit uh, alienating ourselves from everyone because your prayer, the, the, the form of help may come in flesh. Um, and, I, and it's funny, I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna end it. I, I wrote something about a week ago because I had another dark moment. I lost a child last month, had another child go to jail the next week and my grandkids and then my other son tried to kill himself. So I been through a lot. I just left LA with Fidel checking on my son. But I wrote a, I wrote something, I don't know where it came from, but it said, uh, hold on. I'm gonna read it for you guys real quick. Oh man, my battery's dead. Uh, wait a minute, I had it. Oh man. I said, when a hero needs a hero, because that's what I'm using now. I'm using the one that you call. I'm using the one. Hey man, come on, come on. Hey, come on, you know, oh, I'm right here. I'm just here today. I'm just gonna listen. I ain't saying that, you know, whatever it is. But when a hero needs that hero, who does he call? You know, he's gonna pray all the time. First, if he's a real hero, but he needs one that he can talk, reach out, touch, and for them to speak back to him when he's talking. You know, if it's just a hero, man, because we don't, I didn't know how to cry, bro. I don't know how to let my pain be that far out. Like, I can let a tear come out of my eye, but I don't know how to scream. I don't know if I want to. It's too strong. You know, I, I, you know, I heard a lot of people talk about we didn't talk about it in the neighborhood. Well, I was a little different. My grandmama, you know, we, we spoke out things. I chose to be the one to hide because it was my father who I didn't want to tell was mistreating me. So I learned how to take pain and keep a secret. And that's not a good thing to do. Because you'll start feeling like you're, you know, because you're good at it. You just keep accepting and keep accepting it. And then it'd be a small thing. And you'll blow on somebody that didn't deserve it. You'll kick, you'll push people aside that's trying to be there for you. So I don't know if I went way off the tone of what we were talking about, but at the end of the day, mentally, I was affected, but I'm I'm claiming recovery at this point because. You guys wouldn't have known that I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with. Just seeing me on this video right here, you would not know. If you really knew me, you'd be like, yeah, you ain't right. <laughs> but I'm functioning enough, but I ain't fooling myself. If you ask me how I'm doing, I'm saying I'm challenged at the moment. And that's why I leave it like that. Because I ain't never out, I ain't never down. Just challenged at the moment. And that's it. I like that, James. That was really, really powerful. Thank you for sharing that, bro. Like, legitimately. Um, if I took too long, I'm long winded. My pastor used to say that. <laughs> no, but you, you stayed in the pocket, though, bro. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to toss the question back over to Maurice. Maurice, how has your mental health um, been affected by your childhood, either for the better or for the worse? You're on mute. <laughs> I think that um, as, as a lot of other panelists have said, you know, um, I wasn't one. My dad was one to not um, express emotions. And he got that. And I, I guess I later found out that he got that from his father, who, who uh, we, I called him old blue eyes because he was light skinned, lighter than me, had blue eyes. And he was from like Louisiana, that area. Uh, which you can imagine kind of why he had blue eyes and everything. Um, and this guy was strong, you know, strong minded, strong will, but you know, the way he grew up, uh, you know, with what he had to do, he never showed emotions. And so that path got passed down to my father, which got, you know, sort of passed down to me. And then my dad was a Vietnam vet. So that was even more things piled up on it because those guys didn't talk about anything. Um, you know, once they came back. And so um, I found myself, I guess, blaming him to some degree uh, for not having that emotional connection. And so I decided with my sons, uh, when I ended up having twins, that I was going to be the opposite of what he was doing. Uh, but I, I just, I guess I never fully realized the trauma that he went through and the fact that who wouldn't want to be hell? Who wouldn't want to be loved? Who wouldn't want to, your father to show 
you emotions. And so, you know, I guess as I became an adult, uh, my mom was, you know, we had, my mom and I are really close. My dad and I are close. But it, it came along, I guess it didn't come along to my brother, who was very emotional, uh, you know, huggy, filly kind of type. I call him Big Bear because he's bigger than me, but he likes to get really big hugs. And so uh, I remember one time he gave my dad, like he just reached out and just gave him a hug, like really tight. And my dad was like, hey, what you doing? What you doing? And my brother, he's like, man, I'm just hugging you, just showing you love. But my dad had never ex experienced that before. And I think, you know, me and him would give each other handshakes. So he'd be like, hey, you know, uh, you know, stay strong or whatever. <laughs> but he, it wasn't no hugging or anything like that going on. And so I had to, I, you know, I guess I felt some kind of way about it. Um, and, you know, I kind of let it affect me negatively, negatively. But I guess after... I, you know, even having a conversation with my mom and, you know, seeing how affectionate my brother was, that actually broke something, some ice in within my dad. And after that, like with my my kids, he hugs them all the time. He hugs my, my brother. He hugs me now. It's like if he hugs my brother. I mean, my, uh, my son today, uh, he was back home, just came back from out of state. And my son, we were about to leave. I was about to take him. Uh, uh, we were about to leave. But we went over for um, they celebrated the fourth today. And so he was like, you know, my son was about to give him a handshake. And he just grabbed him. Dad just grabbed him and, and just hugged him and say, hey, you know, I'll see you later. You know, good. Thanks for stopping by. This and that. And that changed the narrative for me because I had never, you know, up until that point that my brother gave him that hug, we didn't hug. It was kind of like, hey, you know, handshake and boom, out the door, you know, <laughs> just, just how it was. So that really did something to me and it really it it forced me to say hey that wasn't his fault it wasn't his fault I shouldn't have blamed him for that it was what he knew based on what he got and I said I feel bad for him because he didn't get what he needed you know he never got what he needed and I was like how are you you know his father since passed but I don't know if he ever you know him and his father ever had that exchange uh but I determined it within myself that I was never going to let him, you know, us have that kind of relationship where I wasn't hugging him. I didn't tell him, I wasn't telling him, I love you. Um, and telling my sons that I just decided, Hey, the narrative has to change. And, you know, again, I was so appreciative of my brother doing that because I had no idea up until that point. I just thought that was the way things were, mm. you know, that's, that's really powerful, bro. Um, just the impact of a father on his son um, as it relates to how he expresses emotions, his understanding of emotion, um, just that father, either even with him not being there to model it, because um, personally for me, I didn't grow up with the male in the household. And I think just that lack of uh, a strong male model on how to communicate, um, period, overall, but definitely communicate frustration and communicate anxiety and depressions and all these other array of emotions that you can tend to um, deal with going through adolescence, especially if you're um, underprivileged and so forth. It, it can be really profound and to not have a male there to help you work through that energy. Um, I usually found myself outbursting you know um which was kind of similar to the way my mom did just these huge outbursts you know where you apologize later you know um but just you gotta get all that energy out you know so you oh, everything up, ah! you know and then i apologize later you know but it feels so much better just to get it out you know, um, and not to have a man to be able to guide me um, and a father particularly to be able to guide me and just how to deal with anger as an emotion. Um, it definitely provided what I would call some relationship handicaps for me growing up later on. Um, but speaking of relationships, I want to toss this question over to the relationship coach. Um and this question is, marriage breakdown um, 
is more likely to re- lead to men um, committing suicide versus women, according to the CDC. Um, I thought that was a really profound uh, statistic, um, be it that you would think that more women would be apt to despair over a relationship or losing marriage to the point of suicide rather than a man. Um, can you explain to me what you think? I know, you know, I, I, now that you're a definitive expert, but what are your thoughts um, as a relationship counselor as to what happens within the mind of a man upon losing a relationship um, or a marriage that will cause him to then despair of life? You know, um, I think Chris Rob hey, did a comedy special once, and he kind of said this. I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but he was saying women, children, and dogs I love unconditionally. Men I love with the condition that they provide something. And what I believe what happens is when men are in that position where, you know, it's divorces and things like that, um, the impact of them losing their identity, losing the, their everything, um, society, even the, the, the court system is really difficult on men in, in, in a lot of areas, child support to divorce. Um, you know, like we get hit hard. It's almost like it really is set up for men to fail. And they lose a lot in divorce. Um, they lose access to their children lots of times. They lose a lot of their finances. Um, I mean, they, they lose a lot. And at that point, you're like, what else do I have to, to, to lose? Like, I've lost everything, so I might as well get taken out of here. Um, the weight of that. And sometimes that re- instant relief of death, sometimes it's so much more uh, appealing than the pain of of going through this for the rest of their life. Um, I remember my first marriage, my grandma told me this. I was going through a lot of problems and I wanted to leave at that, you know, in my first marriage. My grandma would say, don't, don't leave your first, don't leave. I'm like, grandma, it's, it's, it's horrible. Like it's not going right. There's a lot of emotional abuse and things that's going on. And, you know, this person, I'm not, she said, because baby, she said, because it don't look good when a man leaves his family. She said, the society don't like that when a man leaves his family. And I think that stigma of a man failing and marriage and failing his family and failing his kids and losing everything is just too much for him. And they just, they, they, they can't take that. And I believe that's where it comes from. Thank you, thank you. That was very profound. Um, I know we have a couple men who were married or are married on the um on the panel so i'll toss that question out as well um if you are married or are divorced was there ever a, a point in your your relationship that you despaired of life um as a result of losing that relationship or either during that relationship as a result of being in that relationship um I'll just toss that out to any of the married men or the divorced men on the panel. I like to say uh, I was married for seven years. Um, I had in that seven years, I probably had two moments where I'm not going to say I was thinking suicide, but really reckless, like just anything to get out of this. So it's not my fault. Because, you know, when you go from being whoremonger, womanizer, all these things, and you on purpose set yourself up to be a good, honest partner, companion, friend, love, the whole nine. Like when you're saying, I'm going to give all that. I'm not just going to be your, your bed mate and the dude you chase after. I'm going to be your life. I'm going to be your support. I actually have intention for your life. That was my case. So for when my things wasn't going right, the thing that kept me uh, from doing that was I would come back to the sense of this. It's two people in this agreement and one's just not keeping theirs. 
That's all. In my situation, that's what I had. We had an agreement. We was going to go this way. We didn't go that way. And I kept pulling. I was in ministry. And to have a woman at that time, you know, for me to have so much zeal and be moving so moving so good in the, in, in, in the, in the ministry world, to not have the real support of my, my partner, you know, I stayed going to function. Hey, where your wife at? Well, you hate that. You know, before it was, Brother James, you married? You know what I'm saying? Now it's, where she at? It went from, okay, I went and got married. Now I'm hearing where she at. So I had many times where I wanted out of there, but that that I didn't want to fail, man. Like, And it wasn't because of the world. It's just me want to fail. I wanted to do better than my dad and my father and any other man I knew on the planet. I just wanted to do it, man. And I stayed longer than I should have, which also hurt the situation and myself. You know, because I lost myself. When I came out of there, I didn't know who I was. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted no more. I didn't know what I liked because I turned so many things off, turned some new things on. And, you know, it, it took a, a nice four-year digression so I realized that, you know, hey, you're just not starting to come back from that situation. It had me that far down. Like I say, I, I'm not ever suicidal, but reckless enough to not care tomorrow, if that makes any sense. And, uh, okay. You know, so yeah, I was in one of those. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else uh, want to share? Well, it's actually, I, I wasn't thinking suicide, but I, I will tell you the going back to the way I was raised and, and coming from the church where, you know, once you make those vows, you are in it till literally death do you part. And so I was married for 17 years. And, um, and so th there was this, this, this shame of I, I failed. You know, when your mom and dad are going on 50, almost 50 years, and then my younger sister got married six months after me, and they're still together, you know, and and you you start to say, what, what happened? Um, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, 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 a violent relationship. It wasn't a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, cheating. It was literally uh, we grew apart. More so, she grew apart uh, because I was I was left still wondering. Um, and even years later, so I've been divorced almost eight years, and there are still moments where I'm like, "Where, where?" Where did the disconnect actually happen? Because I took those vows very seriously. And I'm listen, I would never speak ill against my ex-wife, but there were just moments. And I, you know, it, I think again, it goes back to this whole thing of, you know, let me not generalize. Where I come from, um, to talk, you know, unfiltered and to talk truthfully, it's something that doesn't always happen because that means the truth and the ugliness of it is going to surface. And so it's that thing of, well, skate over it. And yeah, I went through it. Listen, we were the, and I'm not, I don't want to sound arrogant, but we were like the power couple. So you want to know how I met you? You want to know how I met Maurice? Because I was too embarrassed to go back to the church that she and I were leaders of the youth ministry, because I didn't want to face the people that I had failed, especially after so many years in, in marital bliss. And so I, I was ashamed. Um, I got married at a time where I was aesthetically unappealing to, to women because I was a really, really, really big dude. But you know, and this is gonna sound stereotypical, but I say it with some humor. Um, you know, church girls, if you can sing or if you can play, if you big, that's okay. You know what I'm saying? Because for whatever reason, they are, tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm lying. I'm just saying that that's where I, that, let, me, let me just say this, where I come from, Darren, where I come from, if you can play, you can sing, you can be 500 pounds, the brother's gonna have. So, you know, There's I not grew a single up with lie that. being told. <laughs> yeah. So I, I grew up with that. And so, but 
But when we when our marriage when my marriage failed, I walked around not necessarily wanting to end my life, but I was so embarrassed because here I am years later, I can tell you, because I felt validated having my wife. Because when you are, you know, it's that whole thing of, oh, you're married, so then I can I can check that off. But then of course, you know, we we had trouble having, you know, starting the family. So it was like after you feel validated with the marriage, it's like, well, when the kids come. And so then when the divorce came, it, so it was all those things that I was so concerned about people that I was I was putting myself in bondage because our divorce was very amicable. It, it hurt, you know, because I was in it for the long run, but it wasn't nasty or anything like that. But I was embarrassed because I was so afraid what y'all was going to say. And wasn't nobody paying my bill. Nobody was even reaching out to say, how you doing? But they were too busy talking about, I wonder what happened. So when I got free from people, then I was able to heal from my divorce, the, the, the pain that I was going through as far as like, man, I got 17 years in, blah, blah, blah. But what, I, I let the folk keep me down. Oh, oh, thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? Really I, I want to touch on what he just talked about. I mean, I, I haven't been married before, not yet, but one of the major issues that he touched on, listening to people. And I know I wanted to get married at the age of 18 because so many people, Antoine, you should get married. At, uh, this when I'm 16. You should get married. You should do this. When I was your age, but they that person that was telling me that, they didn't mention that their wife was cheating on them as soon as they said I do. But uh, I didn't say no names. I could be paid to do that, but I won't do that. But uh, <laughs> but or when I was your age, I had this, I had that. During your generation, you are a baby boomer. Y'all had it better than we had because y'all could work and get a couple of cents a minute and only pay five cents for a loaf of bread. This generation, a dollar, you can't get penny candy no more. <laughs> I got married when I said that, but. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I missed that penny candy. I don't know where the penny candy went. It, it went to the, to the 25 cent jar. Hello. Hello. Oh. Nah, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. That hurt my feelings uh, even more. <laughs> it went right to the uh, 25 cent jar. Um, But I want to toss this question over to Darren. Darren, so I know we've, uh, within one of the, our previous conversations, we discussed um, the LGBT community and the, the suicide rates that are higher um, amongst that community. As a member of that community, how do you, um, what is your understanding about exactly what's ailing that community that's causing such a significant rate of suicide and mental health issues versus um, the straight community and so forth? Okay. Sounds like uh, can you hear me? There's a little pause there, but I'm gonna keep talking just in case it's recording. It is recording. Um, so to what Federal was saying, as far as... okay. Um, so to reach back to something that was said a little earlier, um. We talked about um, we talked about not necessarily fe feeling suicidal, but going into these places of like recklessness, going into these places where you're making decisions that really do endanger your life. And I, you know, want to gently offer that some of that is the same thing, right? Like the same idea of my life is so either out of control, worthless, um, so pointless, so whatever that we no longer are actively trying to preserve our own lives. That's just a passive form of some of the same motivation. And if we expand our view in that way, it's an opportunity to see, oh, wait, 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 wait. Like 
we've, we've stigmatized suicide. We haven't stigmatized, I don't give a blank, you know, I'm gonna just do what I do. I'm gonna just do me. We haven't stigmatized, I'm gonna ride or die. I'm gonna, you know, it's just, I'm gonna just, I ain't gonna live anyway. Oh. <laughs> and so there's, there's this bigger picture of the demands that are put on us to also not even end our own lives. Let's just be honest, like you have to live this perfect idealized life that doesn't really exist for anyone and you can't like opt out of it. So to tie this back into to a question for Daryl's asking about LGBTQ communities, um, we, see, we see some of the same things manifesting differently. And so, for example, I remember my first time um, putting myself in a risky situation was because I was trying to figure out if I was even gay or not. And so I found myself like hopping on a train, going across town, using, I'm gonna date myself, but using MapQuest to figure out how to even get from point A to point B in secrecy and alone because I didn't have the support and I didn't have a, a space in a community that could let me know that if I had questions, there was somebody who was willing to answer and that I didn't have to figure it out on my own, even though everybody kept saying, well, do you know if you're really gay? Are you really sure? Um, and so like the risk, it's another Uh oh, okay. My bad. No problem. They found that a single adult who is accepting of an LGBTQ person, especially if they're trans or non-binary, reduces the, the likelihood of suicidality like by half. Like a single adult, everyone in that child's life can be actively, openly anti-gay and a single accepting adult can literally be a lifeline. And so to think about what our, what our power is when we create space for people, when we hold space for people to have questions, to ask things, to, to name if they're being abused or harmed or if they're being um, antagonized, like there's so much that happens. But again, like the stories that have been shared by the other gentlemen on the, on the panel today, there are so many places where we're never, ever, ever allowed to be weak, never allowed to have questions, never allowed to, to give up. We just have to keep going endlessly. And then when we die, we died wrong. Mm -hmm. And for us to like push back on all of that, for us to, to like name what we need, I need a hug <laughs> is a completely valid statement. I need rest is a valid statement. I don't know is a valid statement. And until, until we normalize the fact that these are parts of our lives too, that the world that demands us, especially as black men, the world that has told us that both we are a sexual threat and we're not sexual enough. The world has told us, oh, we, we are deadbeat dads, but also like we taking care of kids that, that maybe aren't even ours. Like all these conflicting messages that, com that endlessly tell us that we are not enough or that create the scenario where you feel like you're a burden onto everyone. And so that becomes the driving motivation for a lot of people who feel like, I don't want to live if I'm gonna be this burden on people. I don't wanna live if I'm gonna be this disappointment on people. Those things, are, those things just aren't reality. And for us to be able to take a moment to remind each other that you are enough to remind each other that if it, you can fail all the things in the world and you are still valid and you're still valuable and you're still important to tell people that, that you don't have to live up to anyone's expectation and you're still good and you're still worthy. Like for us to, to start rewriting those narratives first in ourselves, to look back at our young self that, that needed a hug, that needed somebody to play with, that needed somebody to say, hey, it's gonna be okay. For us to start telling ourselves that and then we can practice telling each other that. Um, I'm dating somebody right now and he is amazing at gassing folks up. He's amazing at always being like, yeah, you're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing great things. And it's a practice that comes in such a way that I find myself gassing folks up. 
And it, it, it's one of the things that we've been taught in this capitalistic society is that there's not enough. There's not enough love to go around. So you got to keep it in. You can't be loving everybody. You can't be letting people into your space. The reality is that there is more than enough. There's abundance. And if we live in abundance, then that means we can give it to ourselves freely. We can give it to others freely. And in all of this freeness, we get free. In all this freeness, we start seeing, oh, I'm uncomfortable with receiving encouragement and gassing up because I thought that I wasn't worthy of it. I'm uncomfortable with people seeing me and my faults and my flaws because I thought I was unworthy. But then somebody reminded me that they could love me just as I am. And so, so again, whether it's because of your sexual orientation, whether it's because your economic status, whether it's because you grew up with or without um, certain parents in the home, whether it's because you grew up on a certain side of the tracks, whether it's because you grew up with a disability that no one even knows about, no matter what it is, you are worthy. And um, that's the message that I'm hoping like we can all begin to like speak to each other over and over and over again until it's just normal and basic. And we all just sick of being reminded of just how much of enough we are. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So I'm going to touch this. I'm going to be our last question. Um, and I'm going to ask this towards all of the men um i know most of us are approaching a certain age bracket you know so you, you all you all the fellas um but it says that uh this particular statistic states that people currently um in the midlife are experiencing more mental health problems and unhappiness compared to younger and uh older people that midlife area can anyone that's within that mere life area jump in and tell me <laughs> exactly what is what happens at that particular area of life that causes us to despair at such a, a rate where we start experiencing mental health issues and we potentially become even more suicidal at that age? So I mean, I'll, you could answer this question. Too, I so. will not. <laughs> Until I leave it for one of y'all. Just saying. Yeah, I'll say this. I'm 48. I'll be 49 in September on the 1st. And what I noticed that's given me, a, uh, causing a lot of my challenges mentally, uh, you know, with just this society is the advancements and the quick turning of, of what we grew up with. You know, we are the we are the people that's actually witnessing uh, a shift in society. You know, things are becoming more accepted. Some things are becoming less accepted. You know, uh, on both areas, whether it was good or bad, or you know, in different forms. And we're the ones that's doing the transition. The millennials, that's all they know. The ones before us, they laid back and they're cool in their in their state. You know, they they never, you know, they don't reach too much into this society as much as we do. We're in the middle of it. We're going through the transition. Heck, we got uh, cryptocurrency getting ready to be our monetary fund. So we're we're that we're that generation that's actually going to witness our society do a change. We're going to see it because we got the first part. Go ahead. So what is, is it? Is it the change? All of the changes that's causing uh, a high sense of anxiety? That I believe so. I believe so. I think it's the fact that. Uh, okay, you remember just filling out a job application. You went to well, some of us can remember that we went to the actual office. Okay. Now everything is online. You know, there's some people who never learned how to type in my generation, like me. I work on computers with music and all this other stuff, but I still can't type a freaking word. Okay, I can't. I can't type. I have to go call my sister or somebody. Hey, can you type this one? Um, when I text, <laughs> I use the voice. I don't press the buttons because I came from a generation where, you know, that's, that's a lot. I'd rather just make a phone call. You know, there's, there's a lot. I mean... There's so many little things changing that it's kind of hard to pinpoint, 
But I mean, just look at it. We're advancing in every form from when you was young to, to now, you know, and our, our lives is going to be different from when we grew up a lot different. My dad's and them life wasn't as different from when we grew up. Yeah, granted, we had a few more advances in tech, technology and society kind of moved its way a little bit more, but we were still pretty much same situation. Now we're witnessing civil rights being stepped up on a whole new level. You know, it was pretty much dead, if you ask me. You know, it had this little mirror effect like there was people representing us, but it wasn't. Now, uh, cops are being held responsible for stuff. Uh, uh, racial equality seems like it has more of a push. Um, uh, the LBG, I, I can't see all the acronyms that fast, but mm -hmm. look at all the advances they've made. You know, uh, my son, actually, I witnessed him go through that part and why uh, Darren was talking, kind of reminded me of, you know, it took me back to when he was trying to decide where he was at. And now you got to think about this. My father wouldn't have probably dealt with that if I was in that situation, you know? Because it wasn't accepted, I'd have kept hiding. Think about it. Uh, my son's getting married, <laughs> you feel me? So I have, you know, I'm, I'm accepting different things. You know, I'm glad I'm an open-minded person, I'm, that I'm not closed-minded to where I shun my son out and kick him to the curb, but it's just all these things, man. It's a bunch of little changes in this society that I feel is helping us, uh, with stress, a little more, making it a little more stress because we're witnessing the transition. Other people are not. That's all they know. You know, those younger people, that's what they, they was born here. You know, it's easy for them. This, they don't know Michael Jordan. They think LeBron James has always been the best. Dr. <laughs> James, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, you can bring up names of people just 10 years ago. They'd be like, who was that? You're like, man, it was 10 years ago. You don't remember? So, yeah, I mean, I can't pinpoint them. But I think it's because we're in that change. That's all. Okay. I want to add a little like historical context to what James was saying as well. And that um, the previous gen like we, we are on this, we know that the amount of data, the amount of information that people experience in a single day now, historically is more than people experienced in their whole lives. Woo! Like Good one. Good every one. day we get more information than people ever experienced in their lives. But also just in the last few generations, uh, before the boomers that we talk about a lot were the silent generation. And that was this huge gap of, this huge block of people who were born in a time where no one said anything about anything. Mm -hmm. And then the boomers were some of the first ones to like have these conversations about war and roles of gender in the home and all this other stuff. And the boomers, the silent generation didn't say anything. The boomers kind of had to navigate by just figuring stuff out quietly and, and because their parents didn't say anything to them. My father, his, his father didn't like actively say I love you, but he knew that he was loved. My father said I love you, but he didn't show it. So like you see how like these changes happen with the cultures in the time, but then we've had all of these world shifts. And right now we're in this time where Everything that the boomers were promised is completely inaccessible to these generations. Everything that was normal, like living and working in a job for 30, 40 years, none of the companies last that long anymore. You know, like all the things that were normal for all previous generations are, don't exist for this generation. And so people are like, well, who's the leader of Black Lives Matter? We don't do central leaders because they get shot to death. And so we don't do that anymore. That's not how the world works anymore. Um, but because they only, they're part of a generation that was more so raised by people who were in silence about things, this generation feels too outspoken. So we're mad about Me Too. We're mad about Occupy Wall Street. We're mad about Black Lives Matter. But it's because we were raised by people who taught us silence was the best way to advance and to get over and to make our way through. So now we have this generation that's been speaking out their whole lives. They've been on camera ever since they were born. They've had internet, you know, people who they can relate to their entire lives. And we just don't get it. How come everybody's talking about their trauma? Because we all been traumatized and our previous generations never talked about it. <laughs> they just traumatized us and said, go in your room. Children should be seen and not heard. You don't put our business out in the street. But mm. now we're in a generation that's like, you can't stop me. I have access to the internet. 
<laughs> I have toppled entire governments by organizing on social media. <laughs> like they not going to go for this silent stuff. And it is a profound moment, but it is hard to realize like there's a lot to, to keep up with and it's okay to feel overwhelmed, but just know it's not going to go back. <laughs> we ain't going to go back. Thank you, Darren, for helping me. <laughs> you, 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 you express what I couldn't put out in words. Thank you so much. Whenever I speak, make sure you go behind me, okay? okay. <laughs> <laughs> Clean me up, right? <laughs> it's a teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream. Yeah, that's what's up, man. I appreciate that, man. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say it that way, but you, you captured everything I wanted to say. Thank you, bro. Appreciate that. <laughs> and I appreciate your stories because it's the personal experiences that really mm -hmm. do help us make this real instead of a, yeah. an idea in our heads. Definitely, man. Love you guys, man. Real talk. Love you too, big bro. I look like um, we're going to take one more comment. It look like uh, Maurice had something he wanted to toss in there. He looked like he was ready to say a, a, a good preach word on, <laughs> on was, good life. <laughs> it wasn't really a preach word. I think for me, it's probably mortality. I mean, I'm approaching, I'll be 50 this, this uh, in November. And I, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, things that, you know, that I may have done or should have done or could I have done or do I have enough time to still do those things? You know, because as you as we've seen with this pandemic, I mean, we, the world lost six over 600,000 people. And just the the sheer thought of that number is just it just blows me away. And so, I mean, I've had people that I was close to that I lost and. I know other people do as well. And so that whole mortality piece for me is just, you know, it's lit a fire under me, but it's also caused me to like, you know, really be, I guess, somewhat hesitant and, and more thoughtful about, hey, let me let this person know today I love them because, you know, nothing's promised. And, and while I've always known that, it, it, to me, it just seems more real now. It just, it's just, you know, in your face. You know, because of all the, the, the calamity we've gone through. Um, and it's just it's just caused me to just have a different perspective now or, or I should say fine tune the perspective I had to, you know, be laser focused. And um, that mortality piece is, is it's really done a whole number on me. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Anybody else want to add anything to that question before we wrap up? For our midlifers, what is going on with the midlifers that they are despairing of, of life or are suffering from um, um, mental stressors um, at a rate that's higher than those who are older and higher than those who are younger? Anybody else? Well, I don't know if I'm exactly a midlife, but I know somebody not mentioned no names uh, like a year older than me. But um, but uh, issue is like people my generation or people older, they don't know how I do, but don't know how to adapt. And because like as it was mentioned that information is being given to us at a faster pace and a larger capacity as well is people don't know the concept of taking it all in all at once and be able to adapt to change and especially we mentioned I mentioned it before people that are stuck in their ways especially in the churches we don't do this but guess what a lot of churches around my neighborhood was closed because the pandemic they didn't know how to call on the phones or go online or whatnot the issue is people have fear of adapting and changing because they don't know how to do either of those either of those things they just say okay whatever some people have got to the point take me now yeah yeah i agree i agree um i think that 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 the, the point of that you're making about just adapting to the change i can tell you i'm experiencing it myself i uh james to your point um <laughs> I look at certain changes and I'm like, I can't keep up. If they come up with another platform, if they come up with another, listen, I I don't even know anymore. Um, and so it does now feel like, you know, we're running on a hamster wheel, but now even the hamster wheel 
speed is increasing um, and yet we're still not going anywhere but are being challenged to run faster, know more, adapt quicker and so forth. Um, and I think that can cause, uh, especially um, for that particular age range where usually there is this um, sudden midlife epiphany that we go through um, that you it can be critical if you if you're not mentally sound where it can send you send you to some dark spaces especially if you're lacking a uh, identity and something you know to really attach to to affirm who you are so yeah i definitely agree so with that said i want to just close by adding a couple points but first i want to state that i really really appreciate you guys for being present this evening i know we had to kind of detour the meeting from sunday to the, uh, today so i appreciate you guys being flexible um i want to add that i'm getting help uh for mental health issues whatever they are um is not impossible there are a variety of different resources that are available um so some at low cost some at no cost um but i want you to understand i want everybody to understand both the panelists as well as those watching that it is important to get help if you are suffering from any type of mental disorder or stresses or stressors it's important that at the very least you find someone to talk to it may not be something that's super super deep like as deep as suicide but um I, to darren's point um sometimes we overlook just some of those stressors that can be very critical by normalizing them and you know shrugging them off and saying uh, this is okay or this is just what it is so if you're fearing experiencing a series of depression anxiety um or just a series of emotions that you can't even explain i would encourage you to uh seek help um there's help in the way of uh family doctors psychologists psychiatrists psychotherapists um voluntary organizations community mental health centers even local hospitals and social ag agencies provide a number of resources for anyone that um, is suffering from mental health disorders, particularly um, surrounding the topic of suicide. Um, we definitely want to treat that with a sense of urgency. Um, also understanding that depression treatments are available in the way of um, I believe someone even mentioned antidepressants or a combination of um, different therapies. I mentioned before that I do tapping um, and meditation. Um, and those for me, um, as I've discussed before, were critical in helping me to arm myself with some tools to battle my own mental health issues on a day-to-day -day basis. When I know I'm like peaking in terms of my stress, I dial out, turn the whole world off and and turn into me to really kind of, you know, determine, make sure that Federal is good, you know, that this compass is good because if I'm not good and I encourage, I encourage this for all men because I know we have the tendency to put on the cape and keep running until we break. But I encourage you <laughs> to really take a moment for self because if you're not good for self there's no way you can be um good for anyone else especially not for an extended period of time nothing that's um nothing that you know is in unbreakable usually when when you have a crack in your armor it's easy for someone else to stress especially if you're picking on someone else picking up someone else's burdens to cause you to break but men tend to camouflage our issues by picking up other people's burdens and drowning ourselves in other people's problems and areas so i encourage you to do the self-care take up meditation take up some tapping talk to a therapist do the work to make sure that you are mentally well just like you would do it in the gym just like you would do it oh uh, yeah 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 because <laughs> i know we got some gym heads on there i ain't gonna name no names but um just like you would do it in the gym 
it's important that you take care of your your physical just like your mental just like you take care of your physical i know we got some church heads on here so i'm gonna talk to everybody a wide range of groups just like you would take care of your spiritual to go to church and get that word i need that good word it's important that you get a good word for your mind find a, a way where you can feed your mind um exercise your mind the mind is a muscle you can, that thing you'll lose that joker when you <laughs> pass that that midlife crisis area you know that midlife area as we getting on up there if we're not actively taking care of our mental you'll find that you will lose your mental more and more so just like you work every other muscle of your life i encourage us fellas to do the same for our mental health with that said i want to thank antoine maurice michael darren aubrey aubrey i love it. i i it's in me aubrey it's just when i read it it's just the reading it you know i love you you my big bro you know i love you it's just the reading it and you can't blame me for that it's the reading it and my bro james i love each one of you fellas um as i stated before on uh some of the other panel discussions isolation is one of the driving forces that really um can be the bridge that causes a person to feel alone enough to take their lives so i encourage you guys to reach out to me if you're going through any uh issues um i know i've had some brothers actually reach out and say hey for the girl you know it turns out that this conversation was more real than um, i i thought so you know i definitely want to take you up on that offer so i encourage you guys to do that i'm here um for anyone that's watching you can reach me at hello at federalonline.com with that said do you guys have any closing statements thoughts concerns um before we wrap up well again i want to thank you all for joining and uh i want to especially especially thank the viewers who are watching and and are asking us to continue these conversations um it's really i think it's really allowing us to really see the importance and the need to really continue to join together especially post pandemic to kind of break down some of those communication walls so i really appreciate you guys for watching and i want to be signing off you guys have a great night i love you guys and i'll talk to you later be check be looking out for that email too all right be safe everyone be safe Sir. Good night.